Mrs. Kauai, I think that's it. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right, our next item is an update on school safety and security, and Mr. Pritchard is coming forth to um, update you on uh, our current efforts, ongoing efforts, and, and what we can um, expect uh, related to new initiatives. All right, Mr. Pritchard. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. I'm happy to be here today to provide updates on school safety and security in ACPS School safety and security is on, on the ACPS cornerstones and a shared priority for all of us. So I'm pleased to share that we have a number of items to report progress on and new resources to support this, this work. In my presentation today, we're going to provide a quick overview of the many layers of safety and security measures ACPS continues to keep in place. I'll then provide an update on a few projects and new resources that have been made available to HCPS in recent months. Finally, we'll conclude the presentation with an overview of the field test of metal detectors and weapon scanners. I want to begin, however, by introducing John Casula, who is now serving as the HCPS Emergency Manager. You all know John from his previous role as HCPS School Safety and Security Coordinator, and we're thrilled to have him serving with us in this new capacity. John, if you'll please stand up and give everybody a nice, there we go. <laughs> As you know, HEPS has many layers of security in place through the, throughout the division, which are noted above. Not, no individual layer is foolproof, but rather the combination of these layers helps support the safe learning environments we strive to provide every day. In addition to the logistical layers noted above, each school has established emergency response protocols. These detailed plans are not shared publicly. However, they are routinely reviewed with school and, and division staff. Annual and ongoing safety and emergency training is also provided for administrators, school counselors, school security officers, and other designated staff. Additionally, safety drills of all types are practiced with students and staff. Training and drills often happens in partnerships with our Henrico Police Department and school resource officers, ensuring that all involved parties have shared experiences for responding to incidents. While we are confident in the logistic elements and protocols in place, I want to stress that technology audits and drills are just the beginning. The two most important factors in supporting and maintaining safe schools are people and relationships. Staff members work tirelessly to create a positive school culture where everyone understands their role in school safety. This includes the robust relationship between ACPS and Henrico Police and Fire. The strength of our collaboration efforts is instrumental in ensuring that ACPS meets its goals for safety and wellness within the school environment. At both school and division levels, we communicate regularly and work collaboratively to respond to emergency matters, but also spend time together monitoring trends and issues over time and adjusting system level responses as needed. The school resource officers in our building provide the most direct link between students and staff and HPD. We are grateful that with the addition, additional SROs this year, we have better maintained coverage of our buildings when the regularly assigned SRO is out or on leave for training. We look forward to the complement of 10 additional HPD SROs being fully staffed. I know that the new camera systems uh, and ongoing vestibule projects have been a significant interest and I am pleased to report that all cameras are fully operational and working well. Training is ongoing with our staff and we are currently on schedule to complete the last of the vestibules before the start of the 23-24 school year. This will conclude our vestibule projects. Since I last presented, we have received a digital mapping grant from the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services, which will reimburse ACPS for up to $255,000 for our approved 73 schools to create a digital map of our schools to assess first responders in a crisis situation. This, this tool was asked for by HPD and HC, HCPS, secured the grant to assist with the request. We are now in the process of identifying a vendor to complete the work. 
Additionally, $5 million will be leveraged to fully fund the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Safety Panel. You'll recall these recommendations came forward in the fall following the work of the panel to identify ways in which incident response time could be improved. We're now working on planning and purchasing and soon installing a variety of additional layers listed above. Finally, I want to provide an overview of the field test of metal detectors. ATPS is now in the process of field testing a few different approaches to metal detectors and weapons detection scanners. Our goal is to try a few different methods in different types of settings in order to provide a robust information to Dr. Cashwell so she can make an informed recommendations to you about division-wide next steps. We will be collecting logistical information from each field test site, conducting focus groups with family, staff, and students, surveying staff and family members on their experiences, experiences, analyzing the material and staffing costs, assessing the impacts on instructional time and on the perceptions of school climate and culture. Phase one of this field test will, will deploy traditional metal detectors at the entry points of three high schools, Mills Godwin, Hermitage, and Verano. Phase two will host weapons detection scanners at two of our middle schools, which have not been yet have been, been identified. Weapon scanners allow for students to pass through without removing keys, phones, or laptops because the technology is sophisticated enough to pick up, on, 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 pick up only on weapons and firearms. This technology is being used in some school divisions around the country and is found in places like Busch Gardens and Disney World as they are effective at scanning large numbers of people in a very efficient manner. In both cases, the measures will be in place for a short period of time so that we can learn from, from the experience. What we learn from phase one and two of the field tests will inform additional phases that might be necessary to yield different or additional information. Principals will be communicating with their staff and families about the exact meth methods that will be used at their respective schools so that students know what to expect. Our school counselors at those schools are also prepared to assist students who may be anxious about the changes and methods. Tomorrow, we begin posting additional information and FAQ on our ACPS safety webpage for all ACPS families. The entire field test will conclude by spring break and we will report back to you at your April board meeting with our findings and recommendations. And at this time, I'll be glad to take any of your questions. And if I might just um, jump in, uh, Chair Kinsella, just want to note, uh, Mr. Pritchard said that upcoming on our website would be the um, FAQ, but I believe it's already been posted. All those materials are actually already there. So just a Thank point you. of clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard. Um, let's start. Any questions and comments, Ms. Ogburn? Um, yeah, just a couple. Um, Mr. Pritchard, you answered quite a few for me already. Um, but one thing I would like to have, if you could um, share with us, and this is you know, in an email or whatever, a list, uh, you, you said that there are 22 um, security vestibules in design that will be completed by summer of 23. Could we get a list of which ones? Yes, ma'am. I get this question all the time. Yes, ma'am. Um, and you said there were four nearing completion. Which four are those, if you know off the top of your head? Um, I know the gate in elementary school was one, and I think that is. Excuse right. me, Mr. Pritchard. I don't think we want to disclose, Miss um, Ogburn, respectfully, <laughs> the list of 23 and which ones are nearing completion yes, for safety reasons. Yes, thank it, you. And we we did provide that information previously with some of the background uh, with our master projects list. But absolutely, Mrs. Ogburn, we'll get you that information. Okay. Thank you for catching me. Uh, the the other. Um, thing I was going to ask about the metal detectors, and I know that um, this is in you know, a pilot program and all of that, but at, at the three schools you mentioned, who do we know yet um, who will be staffing those to, to, to screen the kids as they come in? Yes, it will be. Yes, it will be school staff and school administrators and, 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 and ACPS employees like myself will be out on site every day. 
So it's a combination of identified members of their current team yes. who have gone through training as well as members of our central safety and security team. Okay, because my concern to be quite frank is that um, I don't want this to be yet another task for our current staff members and administrators who are already overworked. So I'm assuming if they've been, if they're going through training now, this is something they've been able to figure out how to find the time in their day to, yes. to be screeners. Yes, ma'am. Any pushback from them that this is an issue? Because I know that if we implement this and we have it in multiple schools, we've got to have people who man that. And that staffing mm -hmm. of this is one of my concerns. Certainly, and I would note that for purposes of the field test, individuals identified at a school who may be assisting with the field test may not be part of a recommendation for a permanent standing um, okay. procedure. Some, some certainly would be. I mean, administrators would are routinely um, involved in any kind of security issues that may happen at a school when it comes to a student maybe being in possession of something they should not. Our SROs, our SSOs. So a number of the staff who would be assisting um, uh, while not familiar necessarily with metal detectors upon arrival have had similar roles in the school that deal with um, student um, conduct so that's not outside of their scope of responsibility but certainly understand exactly what you're saying is that you know in addition to uh, looking at the equipment being used in the field test and all of those logistics that we're looking at what are the human resource implications here right what are the right number of people needed to do this appropriately uh, what kind of training needs to be um, on hand so that is another piece we're studying and then um, you know as mr. Pritchard mentioned while we're collecting data about certain logistical pieces of the field test we'll also be holding focus groups with the people involved so that would be staff students families Families to get their perceptions and certainly this would be an opportunity to formally gather feedback related to to your point exactly mrs. Ogburn what is the um, you know experience for those staff members involved in the field test um, as screeners right well and my last question and and I'm gonna state it the way it's been said to me not it's not an editorial comment um, because you said this will be completed by spring break so why that timeline? Why does it take, if you could explain to the listening public, and I again, this is a question I get, the logistics of it taking this long to do a field test. I know we've got three schools identified. You said there will be others. So why does it take until April to get this done? Well, certainly you've brought up some of the points. There, there are people involved, our, our safety team, and so we'll be sharing those resources with each school on the days that they're actually participating in the screening, as well as gathering data and uh, the focus groups and so on. So we want to make sure that we're looking at all aspects um, and that we have those, um, those pieces complete by that date. So each of the high schools uh, involved in the field test is actually um, participating in five days of uh, metal detection screening they may not be five consecutive days uh, depending okay. on the way we're staffing those all righty thank you so much that's all from me thank you mrs. Ogburn Reverend Cooper uh, thank you madam chair thank you so much mr. Pritchard and team for um, this presentation I know everyone is um, excited to dig in so first question slide five um, can you clarify for our new camera systems uh, were new systems installed upgraded for all of our schools or certain schools our secondary schools receive the camera upgrades. And again, similar to locations with vestibules where um, sure, we sure. have not released more okay. than that. I know we've spoken um, to, to concerns regarding the data we would be used for our security cameras and the extent of the capabilities of new technology. So to clarify, do these security cameras have facial recognition capabilities? I mean, we have software that, that doesn't really go to, to that kind of detail. It's not something that we would get into. It is not uh, law enforcement, no, facial recognition. No. And, and we shared some of that information in, in a previous presentation about yes. the cameras. I'd be happy to provide you um, a, a summary of that. Okay. Thank you so much on that. Okay. Um, so can you speak to real quickly how the three high schools were selected to be a part of phase one? Well, we try to go through and, and select all of this stuff through um, where it was going to encompass all five magisterial districts. Um, looking at the high schools, you have one that was in the east end, one was central, and one was western located. 
We're also looking particularly at the designs of the building. So we wanted to certainly uh, look at geographic representation, but more specifically looking at uh, campus layouts. You'll notice they're, they're different at the schools uh, that were selected, particularly with Verina being an open campus and looking at how um, different layouts in the school building would affect the way we're um, able to implement various types um, of, of metal detecting and weapon detecting equipment. Thanks, Dr. Kessler. Um, so, Mr. Pritchard, go to slide eight if you could. Um, quick question. Uh, it says phase two will inform whether additional phases, test sites will be necessary. Um, what will we be looking for to make determination? I see on slide seven, we'll be assessing logistical implementation, cost impact on instruction time. So in other words, do we have a baseline that we'll be working from to determine if implementation will or will not be cost effective? Well, I mean, that's the reason why we're going to actually take the data and take a look at it and see what's going to happen. I mean, this is the part that, you know, this is the part that we're looking at of what kind of impact we are going to have um, when we start randomly start selecting students and pulling them through and going through this this process and what, what, what impact it's going to have. We don't have a baseline yet mm -hmm. to kind of go off of. I mean, we know that we have several things that we have to look through. Yeah, and I would note that, you know, again, a field test is an opportunity for us to learn if and how we might implement these in the future, where, uh, for example, a pilot might be um, uh, early adopters of something that will then be implemented school-wide. So I want to be clear of the difference here. Um, and so, you know, with this field test, you know, we're looking at a number of angles, as Mr. Pritchard described, a number of things we'll be collecting data on. Um, and it may be that part of uh, the feedback we collect leads us to need to ask another question, which means we could do some other things in phase three. So I think that's, and we want to, to leave ourselves um, enough runway to do that so that this is truly an exploratory field test where the data that we're gathering from phase one and potentially phase two um, are helping us learn. And it may be um, while we've identified some questions to ask and some things to look at, uh, additional questions may surface in phase one or two that we may need to work through in, in a phase three. No, I appreciate that because I want to really emphasize that we have as many students involved um, because I hear from um, students in my district, particularly our middle and high school students who have shared their fears and anxieties related to concerns pertaining to safety and security at their school and in general. So mm -hmm. that's so imperative and so important. So kind of last thing I want to kind of say, Dr. Castro, so how can we um, disseminate this information, even if it's this, this presentation, to each magisterial district? I say that to say we have 73 schools and each school, uh, each magisterial district has different needs. And, you know, we have the overall, the macro version of, of our safety and security, but also the micro. Um, mm -hmm. Because as you and I have talked about, it's important that our constituents know that every school is just as important as the other school. Absolutely, and I see Mrs. Cox coming forward. I know she's been working to make sure we have some updates on our uh, broad safety page, and of course our administrators do an incredible job of communicating their specific um, school safety plans. Yes, um, actually this week it will be, or I'm sorry, next week, the school board corner will focus on school safety in both our binder and clipboard uh, communications to families. We're creating some videos that will go out in advance uh, through our school messenger system that goes directly to families. They don't have to come seek the information. It's delivered to their inbox that will have uh, an explanation of the process and some demonstrations as well. And then, of course, we'll be sharing information through our social media, uh, which is where we find most of our students most of the time. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Ms. Atkins. So thank you for this presentation. Uh, consistent discipline and safety protocols are crucial to any successful public education system. And so I know I've said that before, but I really do think that we have to have these presentations aligned with discipline. So seeing discipline and seeing safety. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. And I do know metal detectors certainly are, um, you know, can be a risk reduction tool along with all the other uh, safety um, measurements that we are doing. So I'm going to share just a few thoughts and I do have a few questions as well. So sometimes the presence of metal detectors or wands or scanners uh, makes a school feel unwelcoming. 
Can you share with me uh, any plans, and I know we're in pilot, or perhaps consider as we're capturing data and input, uh, how we're gonna make sure that our schools continue to be this inviting, inspiring, welcoming place. Well, and I think part of it too is the, the relationships that are built every single day at our school, and I think that that's an important part of it, and this is just a step with the people that are there every single day greeting those kids in the hallway, talking with them and so forth. And I know that we are looking at several different methods and some of them is a lot less intrusive than let's say metal detectors. Weapons mm -hmm. detection is a lot less intrusive than weapons, uh, than metal detecting. So I think there are ways that we can lessen this and make it less eventful for people um, as we go through this. But I think that we, through, through this field test that we're going through, we have to look at all possibilities of what's there so we can collect the data and make the best informed decisions. But I think it still boils down to the relationships that are built every single day within the school. Absolutely, I agree. I'm you know, I was going to say, and, and yeah. you know, certainly to your point, and it's an excellent one, you know, that is one of the things we're always balancing, and particularly it comes to our safety procedures, making sure we're creating a welcoming environment that's conducive to learning our core business, um, but also doing so in a manner that uh, makes sure we're implementing every safety strategy, um, you know, that we're able to. So that that's going to be, I think, an important part of the, uh, the focus groups um, and hearing from students about the degree to which this may um, affect the school culture and environment in regard to that, that piece. And we're, we're very interested to hear from the students involved uh, and the staff, particu but particularly related to that um, point you're mentioning. Thank you for that. And then some students uh, also uh, in conversation have shared that actually metal detectors may make them feel less safe and that you know some students may need help understanding their emotions, understanding their feelings, and even understanding the conversations that are happening at home about this effort as well. Are we also providing additional maybe counseling support as well as training our counselors as well on, on this effort? Yes, ma'am. I know that, that I will say this has been a, a great collaboration for myself to go through this with a lot of different people within our departments and go through this. And I know that Dr. Hughes has, has reached out to her staff and the, and the school counselors to make sure that they're ready to deal with this as we go through, just like we would if we went through canine sweeps as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would um, add to that. Uh, so our, our central school counseling team has been in touch with the school counseling teams at each of the three field test schools to have that very conversation. Uh, so that they're prepared <clears throat> and they may work to identify any students they may already be aware of who may have um, anxiety or concerns so that they can proactively address those and make sure they're able to reactively address any concerns that may came, come up. And I know they've also looked at making sure students who may have other unique needs, perhaps uh, exceptional education or so on, that uh, there are social stories and other tools provided to help them understand that things may look different in regard to the school day than they've looked before. Thank you for that. Uh, so some of, I'll just share some of what has been shared with me um, from some students is that uh, it feels like they're being treated as suspects or the other one is that their privacy is invaded. And I think, um, you know, when we're thinking about how quickly or how easy access to information is, particularly social media, I'm wondering if the team would consider reading materials um, for our students. Many of them asked, is there something that I can read um, that I can grow through to better understand? So just something to consider as you're thinking about how you're reaching students, please also allow books to be a tool as well, because there are many that, that really want to read it on their own time mm -hmm. by themselves. I'm glad to hear about the focus groups. I'd love to hear more from a wellness perspective, making sure that there are brave spaces where they can share this information. And so as you're thinking through that in brave spaces, I'd love to hear more about what those brave spaces look like. Yes, and I would um, add, you know, helping students and or staff members or visitors to the building, because in some of the scenarios, we would actually be screening visitors at parts of the day. That's one of the pieces of the field test. Um, you know, uh, Mrs. Cox mentioned a variety of ways we're gonna work to make sure there are tools and resources for all of our families, but particularly our field test schools where students and staff and visitors will be experiencing something different upon their arrival. I think one um, other great tool in addition to uh, resources 
resources that might be read are video. And so there are um, some videos being created that actually show our team conducting this and going through exercises so that students and families can actually see uh, what they might expect upon arrival to school before the field test begins. And also others in the system um, have an opportunity to see what it looks like in action. And I appreciate that. I think as many communication methods as we can find to reach families, because it's not just isolated to students. And so again, I'll just push one more time for the feedback that I've received is for some level of books or reading materials that a student can read isolated with themselves or with their family so their family can learn as well. So wanted to share that just off of a screen with a book or some level of reading material. The other um, thought that I have, uh, and so this is probably more a communication uh, question, but in thinking about uh, sometimes, you know, schools can have a negative perception when they have metal detectors. I certainly think we need them. However, I also want to hear just a little bit more, not on the training part, but the negative perception part. How is that, um, what plans are in place to communicate that in a, in a positive way beyond just the experience? Okay. I mean, that's something that we'll, we'll go through. And I mean, I think as we go through this and we collect the data and we determine, we, we come together as a group and we start determining what are our next steps, that's something that we'll talk about and, and make sure that we put in play as far as better communication about this and what it's gonna look like and how it is gonna affect the school. Yeah, and I do think that focus groups in this um, particular topic is a wise choice. But again, I'll just continue to use the word brave space. I know oftentimes in our focus groups, we might want to choose a classroom. But I think when we're talking about something like this, that it is very important that we are careful with the space that we use and how we make it brave so that students are comfortable sharing how they really feel. Uh, and so I think that also plays into relationships. I think it plays into the positive uh, perception as well. And so again, in this case for a focus group, let's make sure that we are, we're being experts at the spaces we choose for folks to be brave. And then uh, you talked about training a little bit. And one question that I have is, Will one person manage the equipment, search students, and then um, also the persons that are being trained, they're being trained on the equipment or they're being trained on searching students? What is the training uh, detail? It's all what covered. Is, I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's detailed in all of that stuff. It's bag checks, it's walking through the monitors, what's gonna happen, searching the bags. Um, it's, it's, it's all, it's everything. And everybody is kind of going through the whole process. So it's kind of grouped up into teams. There's no way one person can do all of this. Right. So we're going to be working in teams to kind of man people through the machines and, and, and go through the, uh, book bags that need to be inspected uh, on a day to day basis. And then every, all of us went through wanding training as well. So if we were unable to identify anything uh, on, on their persons, but yet they're still, the metal detector is still going off. Right, so, so once yes. they would go through the metal detector, then potentially the wand would be used. And so I was just wondering, again, back to staffing. I have concerns about staffing as well, but more on the training end, uh, because I, I think that it can become very overwhelming to learn the equipment, be the individual to search, be the individual to also make sure that if there's any, issues with the machine, that they have knowledge of that as well. So I look forward to learning more. I'm grateful for your effort and your team's effort because safety is a priority and it is going to take testing to get as close as we can to be effective. Uh, but I, again, please consider the, the well-being around those focus groups. I'm, I'm also concerned just a little bit that we don't just pick a classroom, put folks in it and ask questions. I don't think that's the right way to go for this particular topic. Okay, yes ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Atkins. Mrs. Shea. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Um, I want to start by um, thanking uh, the, the board and our counterparts and um, your team 
uh, Mr. Pritchard for the uh, funding and the implementation of the new camera systems. I've heard from uh, my administrators that it's really been a game changer um, in ma helping manage their building. Um, and um, so thank you. Thank you for that uh, investment. Um, Swipe cards, um, I won't talk about the, I won't disclose the specific location, but uh, you and I have talked about it, Dr. Cashwell and I have talked about it at one particular, uh, at, particularly at one location um, in my district, I continue to be concerned. And um, do we have any timeline on when we might see those? It, a lot of it just depends on when we're able to get the, the, those resources in. I mean, like everything else, I mean, if, if they're available, we'll work on this as soon as and quickly as possible. If there's a lead time, then there will be a delay in that. But well, I know with the funding that was granted to us, we are moving on that stuff now. We have a project manager in place, and so we're moving forward with the blue ribbon panel recommendations. And whatever's there, we're going we're gonna to start attacking right now. Thank you, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that that um, funding has been allocated from our, has it been allocated from our partners? It, it, it didn't need to be allocated. Yes. We were able okay. to identify funding to begin that work. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you, thank you so much. When we talk about an increase in canine sweeps, is that a slight increase? Is it a significant increase? I won't ask you to give me the specific uh, percentage figure off the top of your head, but, but what are we talking when we talk about increase in canine sweeps? I mean, it's an increase. I mean, a lot of it, too, depends on our partnership with HPD and, and when dogs are available to do this. So, so you'll recall in December, um, I made a request to HPD to increase the frequency of those canine sweeps. And so, again, um, the schools were traditionally having canine sweeps at a certain cadence, and we've increased that. Wonderful. Um, as we turn to our field test, uh, Dr. Cashwell has already kind of articulated the difference between it being a field test versus a pilot. Um, I appreciate that clarification. Um, I had to, I'm concerned and I'm disappointed that we are at a place where we have to talk about metal detectors. Um, I don't think that's something any of us a place any of us want to be. I understand why we are having this conversation um, and why we are here. Um, when, we, uh, when we talk about the focus groups, um, how will the focus groups be chosen? You mentioned that they'll involve staff, students, and families. So how will they be? Um, Our Department of Research and Accountability, um, who are trained in, in collecting data and making sure that uh, we're, we're using all best practices and certainly your feedback's um, been taken into account there, uh, will be handling the logistics and we'll be happy to share that at a later date. Thank you. So if there are stakeholders who um, have feedback that they would like to share about this, what is the best format? Well, I, I think starting off, what, what you're talking about immediately? Then immediately would... or um, as we're going through the field test, um, any feedback that they have, um, what's the best format to be shared? I mean, I think it would be obviously to contact those it's... people that you have the day-to-day the -day relationships with to start off and move that way. I'll also just chime in on behalf of DARE that um, we are uh, building out plans to do both focus groups and surveys, um, recognizing that the entire school community may want opportunity to provide input on surveys, but then smaller focus groups may also yield some really rich information and feedback for us. Uh, so we anticipate having those available for the whole school community and the participating sites uh, so that anyone impacted has an opportunity to, to weigh in on their experience. Thank you. Um, you know, and then lastly, um, just, to, just to build on some of the things that Dr. Cashwell shared at our recent town hall um, on this topic, we're all hands on deck and we need families to communicate real consequences for students bringing weapons, making threats, what they post on social media. And we also need all members of our community, especially those with students and children in their home, to properly secure their firearms and weapons. If students do not have access to weapons, they cannot bring them to school. And so um, thank you for um, y'all's diligent work looking into this. School safety is of the utmost importance to, to all of us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Shea. And, um, as Mrs. Shea highlighted, and we've highlighted before, 
metal detectors, whatever kind, are not the only um, thing that's going to keep us safe, right? If you could just reiterate one more time all the layers that need to be in place and perhaps highlight how successful, what has been successful in keeping our schools uh, safe to date. Mr. Pritchard or Dr. Cashwell. I was just simply going to note while he was yes. going to um, speak yes. to that, there's a slide, slide three. I thought he might want to put that up while yeah. he was answering your excellent question because it is a layered approach and we certainly know that uh, it's a number of strategies that work together, not any one thing. And so I thought that might be helpful. And it's, all of these things are in place and, and, and visible every single day within our schools. I think the most important part of it too is that, that human connection that we have. I mean, that's been our best resource in identifying problems and being able to deal with them um, up front. I mean, we have a lot of different resources. If you don't feel comfortable coming forward to somebody in the building, there are resources to where you could email um, and let somebody know that there's something going on as well. But it's, it's that connection, it's that human element that has made the biggest difference in all of our, um, you know, solving some of our, our issues that we've had. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight that slide one more time and the layered approach that's been, that's kept our students and staff safe to date. Um, because I know the board, as a board, we're hearing so much from constituents about metal detectors, metal detectors right now. Why don't we have them right now? Why, why is it taking so long? To Ms. Ogburn's point, for the field study, that it is so many of these existing school safety measures that have been successful to date right? Um, and the relationships um, leading into what you just said about our relationships. What is the timing of our 10 new SROs so that our schools are always covered? Well, and, I, and a lot of that, I know the HPD is working on that and that's something that they, they staff. So we're, we're working with them to determine when that's going to happen. The positions were made available yes. for, at the start of this school year. Um, like many organizations, there are uh, staffing challenges. So I know they were encountering some of that, but as they're able to fill them, then those resources um, are available to us. And we are grateful again for the increase there. Right. And I don't think this is a question for you, Mr. Pritchard, but as Ms. Atkins uh, referenced, is perhaps for Dr. Cashwell, as Ms. Atkins refer referenced that the behavior conversation really goes hand, hand in hand with safety. So Dr. Cashwell, could you just highlight some of the additional um, behavior supports we've put in place to try to help support our students this year? Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, I would just summarize and, and certainly could spend a whole other work session just on this topic. Um, you know, we want to make sure that, first of all, our students understand what the expectations are of them when they're in their in our buildings, right? And so um, that's done uh, every year through um, our reviewing our, our student code of conduct. So we want our families and our students to be very clear on what expectations are. And then we want to help students meet those expectations. And sometimes, um, you know, we understand that takes time. And so it's those relationships that are going on in our buildings, our positive behavior and intervention systems, you know, certainly that's something we've worked on reinforcing when we're seeing positive behaviors, helping students who may be um, engaged in infractions learn um, how to, you know, change those behaviors. So certainly discipline um, plays a role in this as well, making sure that, again, clear expectations, very clear and consistent consequences that are laid out in that, um, and then making sure we're also working to restore relationships when they may, may be broken, that we're uh, working to support students on um, changing their behaviors when there may be a pattern of negative behavior developing. So um, tremendous work being done in our buildings to create um, that culture that's supportive of students and safety hand in hand. So would you, this is for either you or Mr. Pritchard, would you say we've seen an uptick, right, in behavior and safety incidents in our school, correct? You know, I think that is correct. And, and we hear this often, and, and I know as board members, you often hear, uh, we hear from the staff working in our schools that, you know, things feel more challenging um, post-COVID related to student discipline. And so trying to really parse out what does that mean, you know? Uh, maybe the numbers don't change, but the behaviors feel more challenging to address in class. So we wanna make sure we're providing um, our educators and our families the supports that they need through um, school counseling services, 
services, you know, increasing the number of school counselors, the resources available, leveraging those advisory periods and those morning meetings each and every day in our schools. Those are all opportunities for us to work through, um, you know, what we, we know has been an ongoing challenge for, for our community, for our schools. Um, and, and that's been um, a trend we're seeing nationally. So we're really wanting to make sure that we're putting those right supports in place to address this. Do we anticipate any messaging around um, perhaps behavior and perhaps highlighting the code of conduct, right? Like when this behavior happens, um, please see page X. Um, because I know, I believe it was in the letter you sent to families, um, but could we just highlight perhaps this, the student code of conduct and the related consequence to the action, whether it's a threat, whether it's a weapon, um, because the consequences are um, severe. We can certainly think of ways to continue to make make that clear and make that known. I know uh, particularly uh, our building administrators when they're dealing with students who um, may have engaged in an infraction are really clear to parents, but they're, um, you know, we ask that our students and our families sign that each and every year at the start of the school year. That's done annually, even if you've been a student with us for many years. So it is our expectation when families and, stu and students are signing that at the beginning of each year that they're acknowledging, they understand um, um, both the, the rules in the school and the what the potential consequences are. But to your point, uh, I think anything we can do to, to remind folks of that, we'll, we'll continue to look for ways to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Pritchard, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. My, and I do want to uh, thank the board again for your ongoing commitment uh, when it comes to school safety. This is not an isolated topic. In the five years I, I've been in this seat as superintendent and working uh, with you all as board colleagues, this has been an it's ongoing work and ongoing commitment, ongoing discussion. And you can see uh, whether it's been updating equipment, adding additional resources, school counselors, mental health professionals, professionals, um, you know, each year there's been careful consideration the development of our budget and our CIP uh, that we continue to examine at every angle. And so, uh, again, I, I thank this board for, for your continued efforts there and what we've been able to accomplish in regards to school safety uh, over a number of years. Uh, we'll continue that work, and I know we're all committed to it. And we'll look forward to reporting back related to uh, the results of that field test.